for the delay. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. We have a wonderful webcast presentation to share with you today. As we go through the content and you have any questions, be sure to enter them into the question box. We'll get to your questions during the Q&A portion after the main presentation. The webcast is being recorded. We'll be sure to send you a link and it will also be posted on the WCET website. If you'd like to follow along and access the slides, you can get those by clicking on the handout box of the navigation pane. We also tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel discussion and you can post questions there as well. The hashtag is WCET webcast. Today we'll move through some brief introductions of our panelists. We'll discuss the WCET and OLC joint partnership. We'll talk about your common questions about accessibility and then get to your Q&A as well as some Q&A discussion with the panelists. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the chat box, and you can also comment in the chat box. Our moderator today is Russ Poulin, my colleague here at WCET, who is the Director of Policy and Analysis. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Russ. Thank you, Megan, and I want to welcome everybody to this uh, uh, first webcast in a partnership between uh, OLC and WCT that's been a long time uh, coming and we're very excited about uh, uh, getting things getting things rolling here today. Um, again, I'm Director of Policy Analysis and, and work on these things. And let's uh, see who the experts are uh, today, uh, the folks who are going to give you the uh, uh, the updates on where, where we're at in accessibility and answer some of your questions and start off with uh, um, Kelly Herman uh, from the University of Phoenix, and she's a, uh, a vice president there. And I've got to know uh, Kelly over the uh, last few months, and she's quite quite the advocate and very knowledgeable in these areas. I must must say, just just amazing. Um, Mark Jenkins from the Washington State Board of Community for Community and uh, Technical Colleges. Uh, that among the many hats that he wears there, that uh, uh, the community and technical colleges within Washington. I uh, have a group that is uh, working on these accessibility issues, and he'll tell you uh, uh, more about that. And it's made Mark very knowledgeable about these issues. And then, and also we have uh, Jennifer Rafferty, Rafferty from uh, the Online Learning Consortium. Uh, we welcome her, her here today, and she's going to tell you a little bit about this partnership and and what we're doing. But that is us. We want to find out a little bit about you and who is on this uh, uh, webcast today, and that helps us to uh, gauge how we respond to the questions. So uh, we have this poll for you, and so here, uh, if you could could answer this uh, poll, uh, what is your job title, manager, director, dean, faculty, instructional designer? Because we're trying to, again, we're trying to figure out uh, a bit uh, about uh, where you'd you'd fit in, and that we might. Uh, say a little bit more this geared toward faculty if we had mostly faculty and uh, uh, if it's all directors we might do something a little bit different from that and so it helps us to uh, to organize what we're going to going to say and we do uh, do encourage you to uh, uh, give us your questions and use that uh, question box for the questions that we'll get to uh, later on so with that I think I've uh, uh, danced around about that. Let's see where we're where we're at on this. Okay, we're all over the map as we expect. Let's see. Uh, the deans are busy today, so there's only 1% of them. Well, there's not as many of them as there are the other people as well. Uh, strong instructional designer component here. That's great. Uh, with uh, not quite half uh, uh, out of that. And then let's see. And then uh, people who are uh, director running some sort of organization and about a quarter of the folks that we have there uh, and in fact, a little bit, a little bit lower down there. So that gives us some, uh, some ideas. And then now uh, uh, we can think as we uh, gauge our responses. Uh, thank you for responding to that. And with that, uh, to give you some uh, background on our working together, I'm going to turn to uh, Jennifer from the Online Learning Consortium. Jennifer, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Russ. Um, so as Russ noted, um, what I'd like to do is provide you um, with a bit of the history of the OLC-WCET partnership and, and how it all started. 
To do that, um, I'd like to backtrack to 2016, the end of 2016. Uh, initially, OLC and WCET partnered that year uh, to offer a session at both the OLC Accelerate Conference and the WCET Annual Conference. So at this time, we hadn't selected accessibility as our focus, um, but the goal was to understand what issues our members are confronting in their daily work and also what institutions are grappling with. So the session centered on a question, <laughs> what's keeping you up at night? Um, and a follow-up question, which is um, how can WCET and OLC provide strategic guidance in these areas of concern. So, so the outcomes of this particular session uh, can actually be found in a blog post that Kathleen Ives, Karen Pedersen, and Russ Poulin authored, and it's available on the OLC and WCET blogs. It was published in April of 2017 after the conferences, and the title is the same as that question we were asking in the session. What's keeping you up at night, part one? Uh, and so you'll, you'll note that a number of important issues uh, were identified, such as faculty development, um, compliance, growth and sustainability, among others, um, and accessibility was also on that list. So after conducting the session in 2016, uh, we looked at the feedback from the participants in the sessions and we honed in on the topics um, that kept coming up. And one of those topics that kept bubbling up to the top was accessibility. So we, we landed on accessibility as our area of focus because um, we felt it's an area of mutual concern for both of our organizations, and we could also leverage our expertise and the expertise of our community members to address the concerns together. Um, then moving forward, uh, fast forward to 2017, um, we offered another session, and this time we were at OLC Innovate in April. This was a more targeted discussion. Um, we asked that same question, what keeps you up at night? Uh, but this time, uh, we did it in the context of issues surrounding accessibility. And so the insights that were gleaned from this session can also be found in a follow-up blog post, and it's titled, <laughs> What's Keeping You Up at Night, Part 2. And it's found on the WCET blog. This blog really does a great job of encapsulating insights from the session into three primary uh, trends focusing on students, faculty, and systems in relation to accessibility. So after the April conference in New Orleans, um, we moved into a new phase with the partnership and we brought together experts um, from the field of accessibility to form an advisory committee. And so this committee um, took the next steps with OLC and WCET to understand how we could better serve our communities on this topic. And you can uh, forward the slide. Uh, one of the first tasks that the committee worked on uh, was a survey um, for the OLC and WCET communities. And so this survey aims to answer two key questions. Uh, what are the attitudes of different constituents on campuses regarding accessibility? And are there structures in place on campus to support accessibility? So this survey is actually still open and available uh, for you to complete if you have not completed it yet. And we're going to encourage you to do so. The uh, link is on this slide. Uh, completing it is going to help us better define the activities that we'll coordinate um, in the coming year. Uh, activities could include webinars and white papers and additional interactive conference sessions, but um, we really want to tailor it to the needs of our community members. So we encourage you um, to complete it if you have not already. 
another activity that I'd like to mention that the advisory committee coordinated in 2017 uh, was a session at OLC Accelerate and the WCET conference. Um, this session included some of the accessibility advisory board members, as well as other stakeholders from the field. Um, the focus of this session was to discuss the role of accessibility in online education in higher ed. And as a follow-up to this conference session, uh, Cindy Rowland, who is one of the accessibility advisory board members and who was present at um, these sessions, she wrote a, a great blog post. And we're going to be sharing that link um, in this presentation um, as we move along. Uh, you can find the article on the OLC and WCET blogs. It was published in November. And it lays out nine steps that institutions can follow to address web accessibility. So as I mentioned a little bit later, um, you'll see the link to that. Um, Kelly will be sharing it um, in this webcast. So with that, um, I think I've provided um, a summary of some of the major milestones in the OLC WCE partnership up until this point. Uh, and now I would like to pass the microphone to Mark Jenkins, who will continue with our webcast. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, as Russ indicated, I'm uh, Director of eLearning and Open Education at the SBCTC, and I think that position is emblematic of uh, one of the things we need to do in accessibility these days, and with the increased urgency of the conversation, um, it often in our system lives in e-learning or in IT or in uh, disabled student services offices, but the nature of the problem is fundamentally distributed. It's fundamentally federated through our, our institutions. And in the case of the state board, the people who happen to have experience in that area came from e-learning and open education and uh, had a long background in the interests of those. It's, like I say, we work at a system approach. We're a, we're a state system of 34 community and technical colleges. And it's a big problem. We have uh, very independent colleges. We have very diverse colleges, small colleges and big colleges, each with different resources and capacities to address problems of this nature. And so um, it came to our attention from our Student Services Commission in about two, 2013 that these problems were becoming acute in the area of technology accessibility. We could forward the slide for a second. And those discussions started, there was a system work group convened made up of people from the state board and the colleges with the intent of creating a, a strong policy that aligns with our uh, values, our mission, our open access and sharing philosophy, and also, of course, the you know legal and compliance requirements of accessibility. So by the work of that group resulted in 2016 in the state board policy, which uh, mandates effective and integrated access to technology for students, employees, and external community members. Uh, there's already at that time a lot of energy around that on colleges. The way we tend to do things in the state of Washington is kind of an informal community of practice sort of way. There's champions on the colleges. The work tends to be at the ground up at a certain point. Uh, these interests coalesce and people may or may not ask the state board for help. In this case, the magnitude of the task is such that uh, there were immediately requests for the state board to help lead these efforts, both um, just in terms of leadership and in terms of some taking some fiscal responsibility for them. Um, next slide, please. The year after, in a completely uh, coincidental way that nonetheless has really, really energized the work in our system is our state office of um, you know, Chief Information Officer came out with policy in 2017, which reinforced and extended our policy and actually put a timeline on the policy and asked for certain deliverables from the colleges. Uh, those being things like a, a plan to make technology accessible, a uh, 
uh, inventory of technologies at state agencies and colleges, uh, explicitly identifying which technologies were accessible and which were less so. And this really created a lot of energy in our system and of course a lot more um, request for the state board to to take some leadership because um, many of you have probably experienced this. These, are, these policies end up being massive unfunded mandates. And so we have a lot of interest. We're adding things to people's job descriptions, mine for instance. We're, we've got a lot of energy around this. Presidents are interested, this board of trustees, boards of trustees, and the state board are interested. It becomes something where there's a lot of swirl and a lot of a lot of energy being dedicated and what we had to do at that point was put together a, a kind of group that could organize that energy and circulate that energy. The group we put together is a, a nice acronym CATO, C-A-T-O. It's the, Council, the Committee for Accessible Technology Oversight. It's right now it's a small group but the design of the committee was to evolve as it needs to increase its membership going forward. We feel like we have to have representatives from all over the college systems. We have representatives from IT groups, from DSS and assistive technology bodies, from uh, instructional design and e-learning. We hope to expand that. Business affairs certainly has a big stake in this as a lot of our compliance efforts live in our business affairs offices. Uh, libraries tend to manage assistive technologies in our system. They have a stake and of course our public information officers who are really at the um, at the leading edge of this the, and the most exposed and the most vulnerable because they manage our websites and our public web content. So what Cato has been able to do, we decided for 2017, 2018 to go with a very small group. We only have six or seven members and a much broader cloud of, of interested folks. We decided to move aggressively in conjunction with some one-time money from the state board and lay some groundwork for to build on and to start reducing the system's vulnerability to complaint, but also to improve our teaching and learning profile in terms of accessibility. And next slide, please. Mark, if I if I may, that we did get a question here about that OCIO accessibility policy. Oh, I didn't uh, see that. that include, yeah, does that include systems for uh, students as well as faculty and staff? That includes everything, and it includes everything at all agencies. So it's a very, very broad policy. It, okay. It's it, in its first iterations, it looked like it was going to be less applicable to academic technologies than administrative technologies. But the more the conversation evolved, the clearer it became that academic technologies were technologies were a, a point of vulnerability for the colleges and we had to address those just like anything else but it involves all technologies and as you can imagine colleges often have you know 100 to 500 pieces of software running on any campus at one time and it, it's 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 a big task but all the agencies in the state are looking for collective solutions to this right now I didn't talk about those too much because not much has come together between you know inside academic institutions um, collaborating with state agencies. We haven't managed to do a lot of that yet. Okay, all right, go ahead. Okay, thanks. So there were some things we could do with money and with energy and with communication. And those are what I've called groundwork on, on this slide. I talked about Cato already. We convened a system committee to support system policy implementation. Um, at the state board, I um, was able to create a position in my group specifically geared toward accessible technology initiatives. That has been a huge uh, upgrade in our ability to address these initiatives. This person goes all over the state talking about this, presents at many convenings, many conferences, attends uh, board meetings, attends cabinet meetings of call colleges just spreading the message and that has been that's been a very very important part of our strategy and we don't have an accessible technology office yet but we do we are kind of laying the groundwork for a virtual office by creating this position out of e-learning uh, I see that as a position that might move into its own office at some time we understood that we'd been 
promoting video instruction um, carelessly, frankly, over the last five years, and that we'd had a huge uptick in the number of, or the amount of video instruction, the size of our video instruction archives, and that we hadn't really um, had a parallel initiative in captioning. So given the archive and given the, ability, the need for colleges to individually manage their own archives, we decided the best thing state board could do would be to subsidize captioning so people could, uh, on college campuses, could f uh, figure out for themselves how to how to manage that archive on maybe based on what objects are reusable and maybe just a go forward strategy where all instructional videos are captioned. But the state board definitely had an interest in subsidizing that, so we went out and and purchased some some captioning minutes. $260,000 sounds like a lot, but if you break that into 34 pieces, um, that's really, really just the beginning. To facilitate that and to get us some um, actionable data, we developed a web-based caption hub that's managed by the state board to uh, facilitate and subsidize captioning in our system. We have all kinds of interesting crosswalks there, so we'll subsidize captions for instructional videos that are in our highest enrolled courses, or uh, since we have a big OER initiative in our state, we subsidize um, instructional videos that are openly licensed. Uh, we just have a variety of different um, criteria for subsidy, but it's possible if people target their um, captioning efforts correctly, to, that they can get ca instructional videos captioned essentially for free in many cases. Okay, uh, Mark, if I could ask you to move along, then we'll oh, keep, sure. get, okay. Um, we purchased Blackboard Ally to integrate with Canvas as our online course accessibility checking software, and we offer an openly licensed accessibility 101 course to the system. It fills in a couple sections in 24 hours each time, and that's where we are right now. That's our that's our current state. Excellent. And before we get into some other questions, I want to give a chance for uh, uh, Kelly to get in there and give give a little bit of background about what she's doing and what she's seeing. Sure. Thank, thanks, Russ. And I think, you know, as we get into some of the Q&A, we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more specifically about some of the steps that the University of Phoenix has taken um, over the last three years since we had um, an investigation with the Office for Civil Rights. But the first thing, the one thing that I thought was really important for us to have for this conversation today is a little bit of context around the data um, with students with disabilities. Um, and if you look at the National Center for Education Statistics, um, their fast facts and the most recent data available was published in 2016 for the 2011-2012 academic year. You know, they're reporting that we have 11.1% of undergraduate students who report having a disability. And when you break that down by age, you know, there's some really interesting, um, you know, I think parallels that you can draw to who the students are that are studying in our, in our online courses. So from 15 to 23, you know, years old, and about 9% of those students are reporting having a disability. Those are the students who I think we're, we're, we're typically seeing on our traditional campuses, taking our traditionally seated courses. Um, it's who we kind of think about in my field as our traditional student with a disability and then as you know the age starts increasing you look at those students who are 24 to 29 years old about 11.3 percent of them are reporting having some sort of a disability and then 30 plus years which is you know what I tend to see at, at the two institutions where I've worked over the last you know 13 or so years working with online students in an adult learning focused institution you know, our average age was about 36. And so about 15.7, almost 16% of those students are reporting that they actually have a disability. And that really does match kind of the experience that I've had working with students in online courses, you know, I certainly have not been accommodating 11% of my undergraduate enrollment. Most of our institutions, you know, when you look at the numbers of students that we're accommodating, we average in the, the 3 to 5% range. That's been my, you know, um, the case here at Phoenix um, over the last year that I've been here. But, you know, the system that we have in place allows us to kind of capture some of those students who report to faculty and staff across the university that they may have a disabling condition, even if they 
don't follow through and, and request accommodations because students are in the driver's seat there. So when we think about our overall population of students with disabilities, we worked with about 15% of our university enrollment last um, ask academic year. And this year we are, you know, approaching, you know, a little bit more than 12% and we're about halfway through um, how we count our academic year. So kind of gives you a little bit of a, an understanding that, you know, and what I hope you're taking away from this is that we may only be accommodating a small subset of the students with disabilities who are gravitating to our online courses. Um, and, you know, there are many more of them there than um, we probably recognize are there because, you know, they, they think their disabilities don't matter or because on, on the positive side, online learning does inherently accommodate a lot of some of the issues that our students bring to us. So I think with that as a little bit of background, Russ, I'm going to turn it back over to you so we can get into some of the Q&A. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And then uh, uh, I know that uh, that NCSS, NCES, uh, Fast Facts, as we said, they're having uh, trouble with the PDF, but just we'll let everybody know that uh, with the link to that PDF. But we'll uh, want to remind everyone that we will send out the recording of this, uh, the, uh, the slides, and then also any uh, links to any resources after this. And so we'll double check that one. And then uh, get that get that out to you, and maybe Lindsay could uh, uh, check that link while we're while we're talking here. And so at this point, we want we had a few questions uh, before uh, getting to the audience questions. We wanted to start off with a few questions to uh, Kelly and Mark. And so uh, the first question that we have is that uh, why is student accessibility important, and what impact does it have beyond just those students who uh, are needing assistance? And so. Kelly, how about if I turn to you to, to start with that? Sure, sounds good, Russ. I, I, and it, it's kind of funny, I, I just literally said this morning in, in another meeting that if I had a nickel for every time I, I was asked this question, especially over the last year, I likely wouldn't have to work. Um, but, you know, I think it's important, you know, to look at this from the standpoint of some of the data that we just talked about. And also to understand that when we talk about accessibility features that we build into our online courses, that they, they do benefit more of our students than just those who have documented disabilities or those who have requested accommodations. One of the things that, that folks frequently, um, you know, talk about, and especially I know we have a lot of instructional designers on the line today, a lot of the instructional designers I've worked with, you know, you look at this as a small incidence, you know, in terms of how many students we're really affecting. And, you know, they'll say to me, but it feels like we are prioritizing the needs of a few students at the expense of, you know, so many more students. And, you know, there's this idea that accessibility limits your ability to be creative and to be innovative and you know my, my response to that always is, is that's actually I would say the opposite is true that you know by looking at how we build accessibility into our online courses it's an opportunity for us to be more creative to think outside of the box to bring in more innovation and to do it in a way that's inclusive of all abilities and of all of the the students who come to our learning environments and are ready you know to further their academic journeys when we you know look at I was you know really glad to hear Mark talking about captions in his slides or you know as part of his introduction because we know that captions benefit more students than just those who can't hear you know if you look at you know surveys that have been done over the years about who is using captions you know most often it's actually not the deaf it's you know it's individuals who are in a relationship and one partner wants to go to bed and the other partner wants to watch a little TV before falling asleep and so they compromise they turn on the captions and they turn the volume down the one person could go to sleep and the other one can watch their TV and so that is you know something that was designed for individuals with disabilities that actually have greater you know benefit and, and greater applicability to mo more users and makes that environment more inclusive more universally designed and more usable and so I think that that's the you know the message that I want everyone to take away is that while we talk a lot about you know the needs of students with disabilities you know these things that we're doing are going to um, benefit the adult student who may be on a lunch hour and needing to watch a video for court of our class that she's taking and she forgot her headphones and so she can sit in her cubicle and be able to watch that video turn the captions on keep the sound off and not disturb the folks around her um, and actually get the work done that she wanted to get done during her lunch hour so um, you know so that that's you know kind of my main takeaway to that and then, and then uh, I want to get to Mark get his uh, uh, remarks about this but uh, uh, Shelley in the question said something too about the the numbers that you put out there that 
Uh, the research shows that st students tend to under-identify or not self-identify, so maybe the numbers of who we're helping might be might be low. Absolutely. I, I, I would definitely agree with that. And I think, you know, the students I've worked with, and I've worked with thousands of students over the last 13 years that I've been working with online courses, many of them, um, you know, that, that we haven't worked with, you know, or that, you know, have kind of met me on the side at one of a, an, a university event has said, you know, I, I'm glad that your office is there, but I don't need you because what, what I need, I was able to get just by going online. And so, you know, there's a lot of inherent accommodations in online courses that, you know, don't um, require our students to actually identify themselves and request accommodations. Okay. Mark, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead to the next question, unless you had to want to jump in with something there. And see. No, that's great yeah. with me. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. And so, so the next one we go to, there's an article in Inside Higher Ed a few weeks ago, and then, and then we work with our friends at the uh, uh, IPC network, which is a community college network, and they do this great survey every year uh, that talks about a variety of things that are going on in the distance ed and that technology sessions. And that they've been asking this question now for for just about a decade about you know what what are the uh, uh, compliance issues on campus, and then and let's look at the results. I made this little chart out of the results that they uh, that they've received over time. So if we could go to the next slide, and we can see the uh, uh, see the chart over time and that uh, if you go back to 2008, let's look at that blue line, uh, that 73% uh, of the resp respondents thought that they were completely or mostly in compliance. They thought life is good, we're doing well, uh, th things are going along. And then now the most recent one, you can see that line has been going fairly steadily down to, uh, they're down to 33% to uh, that think that they're completely compliant, and then you work with you working with your Cato committee and a lot of the institutions. Mark, what what do you think is going on there? Why why do they why do they think this? Well, it seems to me that it means that we're doing our job. That the communication about what constitutes uh, compliance is getting to be much more sophisticated, and. Um, much more interactive and intelligent and people also have better tools something like ally in our system uh, offers data where you once had opinion about whether an online class uh, online course content was uh, compliant or not and i think the more information people get the more likely that number is to go down until at some point it's going to level up and start going up again i think kelly thoughts on that yeah, one quick thought, Russ. I think, you know, if you look at when that um, that line kind of you know, started to go down in terms of, you know, thinking that they were completely and mostly compliant, that corresponds when, when we started to see some guidance from the Office of Civil, for Civil Rights and the Department of Justice for, um, to institutions about the use of, of educational and, and informational technology. So this is when the Kindle lawsuits, you know, first, you know, hit the scene. And, you know, the the Dear Colleague letter was, was introduced that, you know, told all of us at, at, in higher ed that if you're using technology in your um, learning and opportunities for students that it needed to be accessible regardless of whether you were actively deploying it in a course or you were piloting it and you know that was the first moment where we all kind of sat back and said well maybe we're not as good as we think we are and I think that you know it's interesting to look at how you know that those lines have changed with some of the activity at the federal level with you know some of our disability advocates you know trying to raise the attention on this and I think it's showing some awareness of exactly where we needed to go and what we needed to do and that oh wait we might not actually have been checking those boxes the way that we thought we were and you know along with the increased guidance from the federal government okay let's go to the next question and it has to do with the uh, uh, the excitement that occurs when a letter appears on campus from the Office of Civil Rights and says that gee perhaps your institution's not in in compliance and so uh, what are the expectations? What, are, what is it that they're looking for when they're checking out a campus to see whether they are in, in compliance or not? Sure. So um, we all love it when OCR comes knocking on our door. Uh, so there's there's several things. And, and Megan, actually, if you could advance the slide, I think this is a good opportunity for us to talk about the blog post that Cindy Rowland wrote for WCET after our panel presentation at the conference in October. And um, I just posted that link too. So awesome. Thanks, Russ. Yeah. And I think you know. It, it, 
if, if you're looking, you know, for, you know, steps that your institution can take now and what are some of the things that, that OCR is looking out, I think the one thing that actually isn't specifically written on here is, you know, the, the adoption of a standard and the, the standard that is, you know, held out of among the Department of Justice, the Office for Civil Rights, you know, that the courts have been pointing to, you know, those of us who are in the know on, on web accessibility, you know, really always are talking about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG, W-C-A-G, 2.0 AA um, levels. And, you know, those are 12 different success criteria that say, you know, if you have these certain things in the way that you've developed your, your ex technology and they can apply, you know, the Web Content Guidelines apply certainly to the web activities, but there are there's also corresponding um, guidelines that, that apply to just basic old, you know, regular old use of technology. Um, and we would look, when we look at those, you know, that gives us a pretty good idea that, you know, it is going to be structured in a way that most users will be able to interact with it. Other steps that you can take besides, you know, adopting that benchmark standard, you know, designating an IT accessibility coordinator. So someone who has the responsibility and the authority at your institution to ensure that, you know, you are following your benchmark standard and that you, you are doing what you need to do um, in terms of, you know, procuring accessible technology, developing accessible, you know, courses, and really, you know, kind of baking all of this into your activities at your institution. You know, we kind of talk about the difference between making accessibility into your process. It's it's integrated in and it's you know kind of like when you look at you know the buildings in in the Northeast that were you know built in the 1800s before accessibility you know guidelines and then were renovated and they had a slap or a ramp on the side of the building. It it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. It provides a function, but it certainly doesn't match the aesthetic of the building. And you compare that to some of the newer buildings where accessibility have been considered as part of the design. And when you do that and build build bake that in as opposed to bolting it on, it actually, you know, winds up being a much better experience for all of your users. So that's one way that you can do that as well as developing your policy you know your policy is going to want you know to not just identify your standards but also and you know looking at your procurement policy and how does that work on your campus and how are you going to address those accessibility needs um, and you know understanding what tools you're procuring how they they meet the accessibility standards a couple things that you'll see, and this is certainly the case in, in the resolution agreement that the University of Phoenix signed in 2015, we had to provide opportunity for users to provide us feedback on the accessibility of our public website. Um, so there's, you know, definite communication channels for that. We um, also had to make sure that we were planning ahead for the accessibility of new content. We had to make sure, and you know, this is just good practice and making sure that we are thinking about how do we, um, ensure that our students are going to have an accessible learning env environment with or without accommodations. You know, we had to look at our current levels of accessibility and develop a plan to remediate that. And going along with that is, you know, performing an accessibility audit of all of our institutional technology. And so those two things go hand in hand. You have to know kind of what it is that you're using and how you're using it. So then, then you can figure out where your accessibility holes are and be able to come up with a plan to address them. Um, we also had, and we recommend that you do this, you know, anyways, as Good practice, you know, survey your students and community members with disabilities and to get their input. Um, one of the things that has happened frequently over the last year is as we are um, you know, kind of rolling out new things, we, we, we're finding more people coming forward and telling us about their experiences. And, you know, we can kind of look at it and map it to the standards, but really that, that feedback that we get from, you know, actual users with disabilities interacting with either our courses, our public site, any of the resources that we provide through the university is such valuable information. And, you know, the, the, the last component that is one of the big ones that we've seen, um, you know, quite a bit in the recent resolution agreements is, having a, a comprehensive accessibility training strategy. And how are you going to provide your community members at your university with the tools and resources that they need to actually ensure that what they do is accessible? You know, having a mandate without any, you know, resources to support it, it is an empty promise. It's not gonna happen because, you know, this is an area that folks are really nervous about and they don't wanna do the wrong thing and they don't know what, what they don't know. And, you know, so we need to make sure that we're supporting them and providing them with the tools that they need in their toolbox to, to actually achieve the goals we have. On that, on that last point, I know, Mark, you talked to about unfunded mandates. Is there, what, what if the 
uh, community and technical colleges done to try to address this? Have they just had to suck it up, or has there been additional fund funding or anything? Well, we've done our best, and what we're trying to do is track the dollars we spend supporting the system. And eventually, the the idea is to have a budget line around this in our in our allocation, and to be able to provide system support. But there is kind of a suck it up aspect to this for sure. Institutions are, um, you can see a lot of these bullet points. Institutions are needing to uh, think hard about what capacity looks like at their institution, analyze their need for capacity, and target their efforts to do that. The I think the now and the steps to take now comes down if you do get a complaint what really becomes foreshortened is your time to compliance uh, it's always better in any compliance environment to demonstrate your effort and represent and communicate about your efforts to comply it's much better than having a finding which tells you uh, your dates and times and tasks that's going to foreshorten the process significantly and that's going to drive up the cost in any given uh, period of time so you know these are basically the things the messages we take out to our system as well excellent excellent well this part of this was so uh, there's so much information on this that the uh, we put out the link to, to Cindy's blog post uh, you can also find it on the OLC blog because uh, we uh, posted it together on both sites at the same at the same time, and it was great for uh, Cindy to write it and for the rest of us to be able to review it before she sent it out. And uh, it's a really great resource, and we may want to do a whole uh, webinar in the future just on, on these issues. Uh, but but really good. But let's go on to the to the next question, uh, and this has to be about it has to do about organizing on on campus and how our student how our uh, institutions working on this. And let me read this really good uh, question from Stacy Greathouse that has to go along with this. And let me read read her question. And it says, aside from the concerns of those who are working so genuinely hard in doing the research to make education inclusive, what kind of first person representation is there in the decision making, evaluation, uh, evaluation points, and design on the front end when carrying out these initiatives? For example, how conscious are the committees, the departments, about having persons with accessibility needs at the table and not just being data data drivers? So again, how do we get people involved in all, all, all of this and, and, uh, and who should be involved? And so, uh, Mark, you want to start with that one? Well, we found that it's extremely important to have some kind of executive level sponsorship of all these projects. It's in if you're, it's fine to have a group of accessibility people of people who are interested in accessibility on campus but what really lights the fire is involvement at the executive level from a president or a vice president of an institution that authorizes uh, the champions to really to really carry the ball where they need to carry it and to the point about involving people with disabilities in the conversation certainly we feel that's that's essential in a number of different ways. But I think a lot of times this discussion was has been marginalized as either a technology issue or an e-learning issue or a communications issue. When the teams that we have in our capacity building work represent all areas of the university or the colleges. And they're the, in this case, they're, as I said earlier, it's crucial to have your finance people involved, your, your e-learning people involved, your student services people involved, everybody has to be working on the same projects and thinking about priorities in the same way for the institutions to allocate resources most effectively to get this work done. Great, great. Uh, Kelly, Jennifer? Um, sure, Russ. This is Jennifer. Um, I was just going to cite an example of, of a way that we uh, creatively uh, got uh, accessibility and universal design on the radar, because um, I think Mark uh, pointed out um, that if you don't have the executive level sponsorship, it's it's really hard for an instructional design team, no matter how much work they're doing. Uh, and I and I know you know some of the great grass 
uh, roots work that's being done with rubrics to ensure that courses are accessible. Um, if you don't have that support from the top, it's it's really hard to um, push it forward. Um, and so. Uh, in our institution, when I was working as an instructional designer, uh, we had a, uh, an initiative, um, an institutional initiative to develop uh, an ex a um, diversity and inclusion plan, and that touched all of the departments across um, the institution. And so, as an online unit, there was sort of that question of, well, how do we contribute to this? And and so. Our focus um, was really to say, let's get accessibility and universal design on the radar by, by making that uh, our, our goal um, and putting it on paper. And, and so uh, it was sort of a creative solution um, to work that we were already doing, but uh, getting it noticed by having it be a part of a strategic plan. Great. And Kelly, you're, Jennifer, thanks for that. And then Kelly, you have vice president in your title. That kind of speaks towards a, a commitment from on, on high. And then, and then how do you organize at the University of Phoenix? I, I do. And and actually, even long before um, I thought that I might be lucky enough to, to earn this position myself, I, I thought what a, a, an amazing thing that the University of Phoenix did to demonstrate their commitment to accessibility by having an executive leader. Um, and I think, you know, since we, we kind of had our hand forced a little bit, like Mark was alluding to earlier, because OCR came a calling for us. Um, you know, there were many, many steps that the university was taking to try to, you know, integrate accessibility throughout the entire university. And without the executive leadership, it, it, it kind of stalled a little bit. And I think that that's been, you know, one of the, the main charges that I've had in the, in the little over a year that I've been here is, you know, to make sure that, you know, as, as we're kind of steering this ship and navigating, you know, through all of these challenges that we are on the most effective and most efficient course. And you only do that by getting broad based you know, buy-in. And so, yeah, we have, you know, the executive support. I have the support of our provost and our, our president. But, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is that we also have to have, you know, kind of a groundswell of, um, you know, support and collaboration across the university. And so one of the key things for us was to have an accessibility committee that had some broad representation that wasn't always just about the legal aspect of this. This was, you know, this committee talks about, you know, things and conversations that are happening, whether it's our migration to Blackboard Ultra or um, if it's, you know, working with our marketing team on, on the, the latest and greatest, you know, um, you know, information for pro prospective students that's going out on the website. We need to talk about it from all angles. And as I said to them recently, you know, they're, they I've kind of deputized them, you know, to be our accessibility eyes and ears out in the field because, you know, we do have a small team um, and we can't be in every conversation. And so we want folks who are aware of what the issues are and who can raise and ask the accessibility questions when a member of my team is not there to actually do that. And I think that that's where we've been really effective is, is you know, bringing everyone together who has a stake in it and actually having those conversations. Excellent. And then uh, our friend Scott Reddy from Blackboard it has something that he added to all this. He says, since accessibility enhances the learning environment for all students, look to partner with larger initiatives that are taking place at the university, such as graduation, retention, or improving grades, et cetera. So uh, get involved in whatever the initiatives are that are going on on campus. Make sure that accessibility is part of, uh, part of those new initiatives. And so with that, since we Hey, I mentioned Blackboard. That leads us right into the next question here. Uh, how can we work together to affect vendors and uh, share their solutions? And, uh, and, 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 and I've heard this a lot too. You know, why isn't the, that the vendors are responsible instead of the instead of the institutions? And see, who would like to like to take that one? I can start with that one, Russ, since I, I didn't sure. turn off my mic. Um, you know, I'm going to start with the second question first. And I, you know, I think it, you know we need to understand the legal requirements 
it's not always the end-all be-all, but you know, there, there are some specific requirements that were written into Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and the Americans with Disabilities Act then follows suit, but really the, the teeth is in um, 504. And that, and the reason it applies to us as institutions of higher education and not to our vendors is because we accept federal funds. So if we have federal financial aid, if we have any federal grant money, you know, that in, you know, requires us to follow the provisions of 504. And 504 and ADA the ADA essentially match in the you know the, the sense that they require our programs to be accessible and so while there are no specific you know regulations I can point you to that say you must do this to you know ensure that you're meeting your 504 obligations what it does say is that every program at course activity service of the university must be accessible to those with disabilities because to not do so means that we're discriminating against them so that's why it applies to us and not necessarily to the vendors and you know, all of this came up, you know, back in 2009 and 2010 when the Kindle lawsuits were making so much news because the National Federation of the Blind, you know, worked with those students at the universities to file the lawsuits against those universities, not against Amazon. And that's because that's where our requirements were. Ways in which that we work with vendors, and we do a lot of work with vendors. We, we have a process here where we um, conduct accessibility evaluations of all content that's going into our online courses. And, and as often happens, you know, sometimes we, we see really great things on the accessibility front, and then other times we see issues that need to be corrected. And we've made a commitment to sit down with our vendors and our partners and to say, this is what we found. This is, you know, kind of how it, it, it's acting when we, you know, either do a manual test for keyboard navigation or if we do a test with a screen reader and you know this is what we would recommend that you do to remediate that and we talk with the vendor about the resources they have to, to be able to do that were they aware that these issues existed um, do they have an accessibility roadmap and you know for future releases of their product and you know that will take care of this and if they don't can they integrate this into it so we kind of have a sense of where exactly the accessibility is going to be you know in six months or so when we're publishing this course and students may be enrolling in it and you know we then have to look at it on our end to say you know do we need to have an alternative access plan in place or is you know is it a showstopper you know it, are the issues so significant with the vendor that there really isn't much that we can do other than to say we can't use that tool because there are too many issues and they can't be fixed in enough time to be able to offer our students an accessible learning experience so we look at our vendors as partners we um, you know we know that we have a lot to learn from them and that you know hopefully we can assist them and so that that's how we've been working with vendors okay we're going to spend just a little bit more more time on this one but there was a question from Kevin about does the legal language actually refer to online courses behind a password, or is that just being pulled into the conversation? I would say um, in response to that, and, and remember, I do not have a JD after my name, and I'm not an attorney, and so you always want to, you know, consult with your, your um, university legal counsel on specific questions, but our online courses are a program service and, you know, an activity of the university. Therefore, that's how it falls under the 504 guidelines. So there's no specific reference to online learning in any of the laws or the regulations. The, you know, 504 was, was published, it was uh, enacted in 73 the ADA in 1990 we, online courses weren't you know popular then and, and you know most more recent regulations haven't addressed specifically online learning other than you know we know that it, it's actually an offering of the university so it's covered okay and then there, there's a question from Ron Mila about uh, uh, light well, she's talking about the libraries uh, have, been, have been told to review their databases and such and, and it goes on to talk about how difficult it is to test uh, each different resource. And I know, Mark, that you've run into some some issues with that in, in Washington in, tr in terms of sharing information. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. It's we're we always lead with sharing information. Where we share technology, we share you know, our community practice results. That's kind of the way we want to lead with this. But one of our frustrations in this area is around the expense of testing and evaluation and certain kinds of um, restrictions on sharing that we we've gone um, we've run into frequently we we would very much like to produce a distributed system of trusted testers in our state which could take years and have a 
have those results shared out among our system colleges, maybe we can get that. But we also know that right now there's people around our state and around the country who have this information and they have their attorney general's offices in their states quite often telling them that they don't fully understand the risk of sharing that kind of information or saying to somebody that they found a product inaccessible, for instance, and that what that might mean to the vendor and how the vendor might respond is unpredictable. And so we're running into some conservative legal opinion about the sharing information about accessibility actually increasing our risk to a greater degree than having inaccessible products would. And that's something I think we need to work on collectively and, and think about getting the right kinds of opinions or the right kind of understanding about what testing standards are and what they aren't so we can move forward with uh, sharing results more effectively. Great, and then we've got just a couple minutes left and then I know the uh, last thing we want to do is talk about just uh, resources resources that are out there and I just and, and, uh, have been putting, uh, trying to put the questions in as we've been going going through. And there was a question from Colleen about what resources and, uh, are, and tools are out there for, for accessibility. And just want to, let me just say a little bit about uh, uh, the partnership with OLC and WCT that the, the things that we want to do is that we want to uh, provide uh, more webinars where maybe we go, we, this was sort of an overview of a variety, wide variety of issues. Uh, we do, uh, moving forward, want to do something where we get very specific into what are the federal regulations or, or maybe uh, what are some ways in which we could work together. And so, but we need the feedback from that survey that we sent out earlier in terms of what are the types of things that are helpful, helpful to you. Uh, so do please, uh, uh, please respond to that survey because uh, we want to be responsive in terms of uh, papers, webinars, uh, item, uh, sessions that are uh, meetings coming up this fall that we can do to help you on these issues and want to be responsive. There were several uh, questions I wasn't able to get to. I was trying to throw them in as we were uh, going through this. Uh, we will uh, look at them, and as part of the follow-up that we send to you, we'll send you uh, the recording of this session. We'll send you the slides, uh, and then we'll send you the links that we've been sending out. Uh, but also, we'll take a look at the questions uh, that we didn't get to, put them out to our panelists, and see if we can come up with some answers, and put those answers out to you as well for the questions we did not not get to. Uh, we are uh, running running out of uh, time at this point. I did try to uh, put the questions in. With that, I very much want to thank uh, Jennifer, Kelly, and Mark for their expertise today and putting this together. Uh, that certainly there's the contact information that you can reach out to all of us. Looking forward to a fruitful partnership with uh, uh, OLC in doing more of these things and getting into more specifics. Uh, along the way in the future. And with that, thank you to Megan. I'm going to turn it back to you to um, take us on out. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Russ, and thank you to our panelists. So just a few slides that we're going to run through to tell you more about some of the work that our organizations are doing. You can visit our website and access our blog. There were several times that that was referenced. And I'll also be sure to send you a link to the survey because we would like you to fill that out so we can be sure that we're putting our efforts where they're essential for you. We have a leadership coming up, leadership summit coming up June 5 to 6 in Newport Beach, California. And one of the key themes of that summit is accessibility, equity, and data analytics. So make sure to register, space is limited. And our call for proposals for our annual meeting will be opening up very, very soon. I'm ready to just turn that on this week. So be looking for that and submit your proposal for our annual meeting, October 22nd to the 24th in Portland. OLC has several professional development opportunities coming up, including an ADA and web accessibility workshop on June 4 to 10. And their Innovate conference, which will be in Nashville coming up, you won't, you want, to, you won't want to miss that, including a pre-conference workshop on Tuesday. All of our webcast resources, including captioned versions of the recordings, are available on the WCET webcast page. And our next webcast is on April 3rd, organizing and supporting successful multi-institution institution consortia. 
Thank you to our WCET supporting members and our sponsors that underwrite our programs and events here at WCET. So again, look for more information coming shortly. And thank you so much to our panelists. And thank you for your excellent questions and your participation in today's webinar. Have a great afternoon.